is a um, Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is episode 188, February 21st, 2018, recorded. And uh, you can see all of my episodes at my um, video blog, walkinthepark.tv, walkinthepark.tv. That's a, that's a URL. Um, Walk in the Park is a um, public access television series in Ithaca, New York. You can see all of our series at pegasus.webstarts.com. Pegasus stands for Public Educational Government Access System. So uh, anybody can become a, any uh, resident in the area here can become um, a Pegasus producer, a public access television producer. You come down here, take a class, and uh, get certified to do it. And we have a studio and equipment that you can take out and do all kinds of interesting things. It's your voice, as it says. And we also have a Facebook page the uh, at Pegasus TV. You can check us out there. Often things are posted there, new show notices, sometimes in videos. And then actually on the Pegasus website, there are the latest, some of the latest shows that you can actually watch online if you want. So uh, online and also on TV. You go to my website, you can see the full schedule of um, the cable casts for the following, for the ensuing week after each show. So uh, we're going to go out in the woods. It's been really nice this week. Uh, warm temperatures. We have temperatures in the 60s, maybe, may, maybe even 70 yesterday perhaps this morning as well. So this is the Rim Trail at Buttermilk Falls State Park yesterday afternoon. Look at those folks that are wearing um, shorts and t-shirts. I wasn't wearing a short and t-shirts, but they were. And the trail's kind of muddy, you can see. But something else has been coming out in this weather, and that is the black-legged tick, or more commonly known as the deer tick. And um, you uh, want to be very careful with that. I was talking to Jim Brophy, who is the uh, park manager at um, Robert H. Treeman and Buttermilk Falls State Parks, and he said these guys have been woken up by the warm weather, and they are out and about, and their staff have been pulling them off of them the last couple of days. If you want to find out a lot more about deer ticks and how to prevent yourself from getting Lyme disease um, or dealing with Lyme disease, you can go to one of my episodes, episode 169, TikTok. Just go to my website, go to the search and uh, the search bar there and type in TikTok or episode 169. And uh, you can see a half an hour show about it. So we're going to continue to go out in the woods here and look at some other things going on. Now, because it's so warm, people tend to want to go out. This is also at Buttermilk Falls. This is looking from that same trail down into the uh, the gorge, to the gorge trail. And all that white you see there is the gorge trail covered with ice. So even when there's no snow in the woods and it's, it's mild temperatures, the gorges may still be full of ice because ice builds up in there and it takes a long time to melt out. Sometimes in some of the gorges like Watkins Glen, there's sections where they don't get the ice out of there until till late May. So this is looking from that same rim trail just a couple of days ago. And
base of the needle, excuse me, and eventually kill it. And a tree cannot live without its leaves, and the needles are the hemlock's leaves. So here is a forest in North Carolina. This is actually Linville Gorge along the Blue Ridge Parkway in one of the national forests down there. I think maybe Nantahala. Nantahala, Nantahala, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, national forest. And all those dead trees there you see are eastern hemlocks that have been killed by the hemlock, woolly, adelgid. And here is a map that shows three years ago the extent of the infestation of the um, hemlock, woolly, adelgid. And the areas where you see this dark like that are uh, areas that have heavy infestation. That includes our area in, ups in central New York. And then the green is the traditional, it's the, the uh, historic native range of the eastern hemlock. And so there are areas to the north in the Adirondacks and up in Canada that has still have not been defoliated and, and the trees killed. This is from the fall, this past fall, October 25th, a map of confirmed hemlock woolly adelgid in New York State by town. So uh, you can see that there's Hudson Valley into the Catskills, Long Island, and then the southern tier uh, in the Finger Lakes area, at least the southern half of it, is infested. And uh, there's the dark red areas or areas that were uh, seen to be uh, new infestations in just last year. So and then before that, the other, the, the pink ones were earlier infestations. So it's spreading and it's a real problem. And so we're gonna take a look at a short video it's about three or four minutes that was uh, made by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that will tell us a little bit more about the hemlock, woolly adelgid, and what is being done about it. Let's take a look at that here. Let me bring that right up here in a second here. Okay, coming up. of insect pest of hemlock trees. It actually threatens hemlocks across a lot of eastern North America, including right here in New York. My name is Jason Denham. I'm a forester with DEC, and I like to call myself a forest health specialist. Well, you might see us out there uh, looking at hemlock branches, holding them right in front of our face as we pull them down from the trees to try and survey for, for the pest itself. Oh, here's some good hemlock woolly dildid sacs right here. So that's these cottony uh, puff balls that are attached to the twig right at the base of the needle not out on the needle, but right near the base. The hemlock is a foundation species. It's an essential component in any habitat that it grows in. It provides a, a dense shaded canopy that uh, moderates stream temperatures so that trout and other aquatic animals can thrive there. It prevents erosion on stream banks. Along rivers, it also absorbs nutrients and other pollutants that come from, for example, agricultural runoff. So it absorbs a lot of those pollutants before they enter our waterways. New York has more eastern hemlocks than any other state in the U.S., with the highest concentration of hemlocks in the Adirondack Park. The DEC is working to slow the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid into the Adirondacks, where it will have a profound impact on the ecology and aesthetics of the park if left unmanaged. And look on the data sheet that for an entry that says DEC no is working closely with partners both to track the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid across the state as well as to uh, work on uh, biological control, which is simply just using natural enemies of a pest to help control its population, as well as uh, chemical controls where appropriate to try and keep hemlock alive across the landscape. The chemical treatment for hemlock woolly adelgid is considered a short-term management strategy by DEC. We use two different chemicals to treat hemlock woolly adelgid. The first offers a quick knockdown of the adelgids that are already living in the tree and offers protection for about a year afterwards. The second chemical we use takes months, if up to a year, to get through the entire tree and offers long-term protection, up to seven years. So that chemical is better for trees that are currently uninfested, but have the potential to become infested in the near future. 
We actually have a great partnership with Cornell University and their Hemlock Initiative, uh, especially in the, the realm of biological control, which is just simply using the natural enemies of a pest to, in order to control it. Biocontrol has been shown to be the most effective solution to controlling populations of hemlock woolly adelgid. A few more years of research are needed, though, until biocontrol efforts can be established. Uh, right now, we're helping to fund a, a biocontrol laboratory at Cornell, which is going to be raising uh, species which are predators of hemlock woolly adelgid to be released here, right here in New York State. And uh, they're also great partners for us in, in terms of monitoring the status of hemlock woolly adelgid across the state and uh, reaching out to the public to help uh, inform them and get more volunteer help. Like what we did at Prospect was just Folks who are interested in can, uh, can take a volunteer IMAP training and help to uh, track and report occurrences of hemlock woolly adelgid as well as a number of other invasive pests and invasive species across the state. And that's a great help to us. I think we have to get down closer to the water to find a bunch of them. By reporting new locations, you help us know where the pest actually is, and you may actually uh, report a location where it would be important to uh, take some sort of control or management action to slow the spread of the pest across the state. Okay, so um, actually a lot of these surveys that are done for most of the surveying uh, for the hemlock woolly adelgid is done this time of year because those white uh, woolly egg sacs, they call it um, hemlock woolly adelgid, is that, f that uh, white uh, material um, on the insects is um, most visible now. And then the insects will be, uh, eggs will be hatching, the egg sacs will open, the eggs will be hatching and they'll be spreading in the, in the spring and summer, I guess. So um, anyway, uh, let's see, I'll just take a, little station break here we are uh, this is walk in the park walk in the park TV you can see all of my shows including another one that we had uh, last year about the hemlock woolly adelgid much more in depth I'll talk to you about that in a second um, the uh, here's a picture what what is going on in our local parks this is a picture taken by uh, some state park technicians that were surveying hemlock woolly adelgid damage on trees on the the uh, the rim trail in the gorge at Robert Treeman State Park. And there's some really stately trees there. And you see the the um, uh, pin there with the label uh, that a number on it that um, for this tree because this tree is infested, so it needed treatment. I don't know what's happened for that particular tree since then, but they have been doing some treatment uh, on uh, particular trees in the parks. So I was just talking to the park mm -hmm. manager this morning. Um, they have they have made the um, well. By the way, you look up that tree, you can see that the foliage is pretty thin. So that means that the the insect has uh, killed a lot of the needles. So I don't know what the shape that particular tree is in, but um, the uh, the park has uh, volunteered to be one of the sites for the release of of uh, biocontrol measures like this insect, which um, is called. Uh, the Laracobius nigrinus beetle that eats these um, eats the hemlock woolly adelgid, and uh, we saw that other one with the the other insect. So the there is a, now a New York State hemlock initiative, keeping the legacy alive. So we're trying to save our hemlock trees. I'm going to quote a little bit from their website. Our mission is to coordinate statewide efforts of landowners, state and federal agencies government officials and concerned citizens to conserve New York's hemlock trees. We integrate research, management, outreach to conserve New York's hemlock resources in the face of multiple threats, particularly the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is often abbreviated to be HWA, an invasive insect. Additionally, we research and implement biological control strategies for insect forest insect pests. So we're going to go down to, uh, now they'll go to their web page, the New York Hemlock the State, New York State Hemlock Initiative. You can see that Cornell University actually maybe doesn't show on your screen, but at the top is a Cornell University logo. So this is at Cornell. New York State Hemlock Initiative is based at Cornell, and while our outreach focus is in the Finger Lakes region, we are involved with hemlock conservation throughout the state. Our current projects focus on developing training materials for volunteer groups, establishing connections with organizations and individuals with an interest in hemlock Let's see, hemlock conservation and collaborating with New York's partnerships for regional invasive species management, or PRISM. 
regions to outline priorities for hemlock conservation within and across regions. Okay, let's go to our next year. They have a Facebook page, which you can go to. You can sign up and like it and check in on the New York State Hemlock Initiative. So uh, that's a good place. They also have, uh, you go to the website, you can get, and on the, and on the um, um, Facebook page, you can get a link to the Hemlock Tri Tribune, New York State Hemlock Initiative newsletter. So you can really keep up to date on this and uh, maybe get involved, find out how to get involved in helping with surveys, that sort of thing, because we really know, need to know where the hemlock is invading, where it is spreading, so that uh, we can, they can plan um, management responses. Hopefully we uh, get uh, enough uh, development of the biocontrol insects that are predators on the hemlock woolly adelgid to um, raise enough of them to put them in at least the most critical areas like parks and save at least some of our hemlock trees. But uh, as you can see from that earlier map, there's a lot of places like some of our national parks, like I showed you in, in um, the Blue Ridge Parkway. Shenandoah National Park lost its hemlocks uh, really bad. It's really sad there because they had some beautiful old, old growth forests that were hemlocks that are gone now. Well, we're going to uh, change our subject here. We're going to go take a look at uh, uh, a Park Minute. I make I have a Park Minute series here. And uh, this one was from a year ago in February when we also had some mild weather and the local waterfalls had the optimum level of flow on them. So I made a little short video, a little Park Minute video about that. So let's take a look at that here. We'll bring that up in a second here. Yeah, that'll take a, just a second to come up. And we'll take a look at our... Unusually warm weather in February melted snows in the hills around Cayuga Lake and filled waterfalls to perfect levels. Okay, our local waterfalls. Now we're going to go, uh, well, I'm a member of the Finger Lakes Land Trust, which is uh, creating preserves throughout the region to try to protect our, our uh, beautiful natural uh, landscapes and resources in the area. So, and uh, I'm a member, if you're a member, you get their wonderful four-color glossy newsletter, and it has all kinds of news in it here. Sometime maybe I'll go in more detail on some of the stories in that, but I'm going to, I went to the website just to get... Uh, it's just a highlight of something going on. We're going to go over to uh, to Owasco Lake. Now, here's our um, space picture here of the Finger Lakes. And in the middle, are where it says Finger Lakes, that's Seneca Lake. And to the right of it is Cayuga Lake. And we're, of course, down at the southern end in Ithaca. And just to the right of that, you might see that uh, line that goes down there that actually goes down the center of Owasco Lake, which is the next lake over to the east from Cayuga Lake, significantly smaller. Well, the Finger Lakes Land Trust has done some great land preservation there. The, um, 
The Land Trust is protecting 1,100 feet of Owasco Lake shoreline through the acquisition of 74 acres in the town of Owasco, Cayuga County. The Land Trust intends to manage the site as a public conservation area and will restore wetlands to filter runoff to the lake. A hiking trail will traverse the site's diverse wildlife habitats while also providing access to scenic views of Owasco Lake. The property features forested bluffs overlooking the lake as well as meadows, brushland, hayfields, and a rugged gorge. The site was identified as a priority for protection through a systematic effort by the Land Trust to identify and assess properties within the Finger Lakes region that feature 1,000 feet or more of undeveloped shoreline. So this is a really important uh, um, uh, measure for protecting the quality, the water quality of our lakes, to say nothing of the, of the aesthetics of the place, but uh, uh, protecting shoreline, protecting the watershed areas from having too, many, uh, too much silt, too many nutrients coming into the lake, too much erosion, that sort of thing. Is, is vital to the future health of the lakes and or maybe re in some cases restoring the health of the lakes. So, so uh, kudos to the Finger Lakes Land Trust. They've done tremendous things. I encourage you to uh, become a member. Uh, go to their website, flt.org, and you can become a member of the Finger Lakes Land Trust and help preserve our Finger Lakes. They have been uh, doing quite a lot over the years. A very active, very positive organization. So. Well, now we're going we're gonna to pop over to uh, Watkins Glen. I've got a short video to show you there. Um, last time, last episode, 187, uh, I showed a video of the gorge. Well, first of all, here's the Watkins Glen State Park at the south end of Seneca Lake. And then you see just where that marker is, there is a, um, uh, a dark green line. That's actually the gorge of Watkins Glen. And it is the state park there. And... Then we'll fly around and look in from the east, from actually where that that uh, marker is. We'll be looking upstream into the gorge there, and we're going to go into that gorge. I actually showed uh, this uh, much of this video the last episode, and uh, we stopped at this uh, pothole or plunge pool or whatever you want to call it, and uh, I left off a question as to what caused this. So we're going to answer that question in this sort of extended version of what it did before. Uh, let's see, okay, let me get this right here. Okay, coming right up. Coming right up. Once you emerge from the spiral tunnel, a new section of Watkins Glen opens up to you. It was called Glen Obscura before the state park was created because the trail climbed out of the gorge by the still existing cliff path up to Point Lookout and bypassed the Glen Obscura section. In the 1800s, you could only see Glen Obscura from a footbridge over the gorge ahead. The iron bridge was built in the early 1870s and its original ironwork is still in place today. Now it's called the Suspension Bridge, and it connects the trails on the two rims of the gorge. In the 1800s, the Suspension Bridge connected the Swiss Chalet on the north rim, on the left, with the Glen Mountain House on the south rim. The Glen Mountain House could accommodate 300 guests. The kitchen and dining room were located in the Swiss Chalet, and hotel guests would walk across the bridge to eat. The Glen Mountain House Hotel burned down in 1903 and the Swiss Chalet was dismantled following the creation of the State Park in 1906. After the State Park was created, a tunnel was cut in a rock barrier in Glen Obscura that permitted the gorge trail to continue uninterrupted. Immediately below the suspension bridge is a large pothole. Many if not most potholes in the Glen particularly large ones like this, have formed at the base of waterfalls where powerful energy swirls rocks and grit. But there is no waterfall here. A thousand years ago, there may have been a sizable waterfall pouring into this pothole. In the intervening time, Glen Creek would have eroded the entire ledge supporting the waterfall, leaving the wishing well as a relic of a cascade long gone. Perhaps Indians admired this pool's waterfall a thousand years ago. 
There must have been hundreds of waterfalls that are now long gone, eroding the rock of Watkins Glen at levels above your head. Okay. Uh, so that's all we have time for. I thank you for joining me, and I encourage you to turn off this screen and put on some light-colored clothing and maybe put your, the, your uh, uh, socks around the bottom of your, your uh, pants cuffs or whatever, or, or wear some gaiters or that sort of thing, and go on out and uh, go for a walk in the park. And come when you get home, check for ticks. Every evening, check for ticks. See you again soon. Um...